Yeah. Oh, I would eat vegan ice cream every night. So there's so many, like there's so much vegan junk food now. And just like with the keto world, there's a lot of things that say keto. They're not really keto, but that's another thing. Hello, Wellness Warriors. I'm excited today because I finally found someone who's doing keto and apparently vegan. We're going to be talking to Diane from our healing journey with metabolic psychiatry. I'm going to let you jump right in, Diane, because I can't wait to hear this story. Let me just say it's an honor to be here, Violet. I am so grateful that you're giving me the opportunity to share my story. And um, recently I spoke at the first metabolic psychiatry conference in Boston, and I hadn't prepared what I was going to say that much. And I, and I found myself saying I'm keto first and vegan second because I'm most passionate about keto. I'm not trying to be the poster child or poster woman for veganism. It is just part of who I am. Um, very recently in my life, I'm 53 years old and I didn't start this lifestyle um, until I was 47. So I had been a media, very active meat eater most of my life. But I'll shove that aside a little bit and back up a little bit. Um, I guess I should start out by telling your warriors that I, uh, I was diagnosed with something called postpartum bipolar disorder. Uh, it's a form of bipolar disorder that's not as well known as postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis and the other perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And it is triggered by childbirth. So I've, I have two daughters and after my first baby was born, it started to bubble up a little bit, but then um, the bipolar symptoms, but then they subsided. Um, they manifested as something called hypomania, which is being very happy. That's how it appears. So it didn't raise any red flags and I was able to sleep after I had her. And uh, for anyone who suffers from bipolar disorder, they know that sleep is the linchpin of stability. It's one of the main linchpins. So let's fast forward a couple years and I had my second daughter and this time uh, the bipolar disorder was triggered. Uh, I stopped sleeping. Um, I was hypomanic and I started doing something really weird. And this is when my own red flag appeared to myself. I started doing something called hypographia um, or I'm sorry, hypergraphia, which is nonstop writing. I am a writer. I've always been a writer. Uh, I've had articles published, I've had a book published, but this was different. This is where you write no matter what. I was breastfeeding two babies, a baby and a toddler. I was writing on my laptop. Uh, you write on strange objects, you write on mirrors, you write on your body. And my husband was there and he was like, what's going on? And I was, I was, um, I was coherent enough to think this is really weird. So I Googled it, I Googled nonstop writing and up came this term I had never heard before, hypergraphia. And then um, up came a doctor's name, Dr. Alice Flaherty. And she had written a book called The Midnight Disease, which explains this phenomenon. She is a psychiatrist and she experienced it. So I was like, whoa, this woman went through the same thing I went through. So I somehow found her office phone number and I called her office and she actually took time to speak to me. Um, meanwhile, other symptoms of bipolar disorder were, were manifesting like um, hype, like very rapid pressurized speech. I would talk like way faster than I'm talking right now. Uh, I wasn't sleeping. So I'm talking to this Dr. Flaherty and she said, you need to just listen up. She basically said in a slightly nicer way, you need to shut up <laughs> and listen to me because what you're going through is serious and I can't diagnose you over the phone, but you need to go get treatment. And so I was like, okay. And I talked to my husband and I should um, back up again because I grew up with a father who had bipolar disorder. And so I've been around it my whole life and I never thought I would get it. Um, he was a violinist with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He was extremely gifted. Um, he, I saw this man suffer terribly. I saw him go to the psychiatric hospitals. Uh, I was the one who could cheer him up. And I also was the one who, as, as much as he was admired by everybody, um, I did look down on him for having this horrible illness that would keep him inside. We lived in Los Angeles um, and it was always sunny, but he'd be in his room and it'd be dark and smell bad and he'd just be under the covers. I mean, this is someone who graduated from Juilliard and had a Fulbright scholar scholarship to Paris. Um, but so I'd see, the, I'd see this in front of me. And I said to him, "Do you, as a teenager, I said, do you think I'll ever get this, dad? And he would call me little Diane 
because I was, the, I'm going to just say it, I was the apple of his eye and I miss him so much. And he said, you know, first he said, you're not going to get it. But then he kind of backpedaled and he said, well, if you do get it, by the time it happens, they're going to come up with a cure. So I just was like, you know, I was 16, 17. I just put it on the back burner of my mind. And uh, I looked at all people with this kind of illness as just like nutso. Well, don't do that in life, everybody, wellness warriors, because you never know how your life's going to change. You know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, childbirth triggered my bipolar disorder, and that was in 2007. Um, I was in psychiatric units at least 12 times while I had a baby and a toddler. It's a terrible time to be locked up in a psych ward. I mean, they suck anyway, but that's not when you want to be in one away from your baby and your toddler and your husband. Um, and then I, my dad died, and I knew he was going to die, and I had been dreading it for so long. And he, he made a miraculous recovery at one point and he lasted a couple more years and then um, he did die. And I, I was so attached to him. He was kind of like my rock despite his mental illness that um, I became acutely suicidal uh, for the second time. And I told my husband, you know, please, please get me to the ER because I just don't know what to do. I, I want to take my own life. And so we did that and I, I asked for uh, electroconvulsive therapy, which is something also I never thought I would ask for and I did not want, but I really felt like I was at the end of my rope, literally. And um, I had it and it saved my life. And I know with a lot of people, they've had terrible, terrible side effects, memory loss, all kinds of stuff. But for me, it worked and I went on to have it as an outpatient. So I had 28 treatments total. Um, and if I needed it again, I would do it. Um, but I've been, you know, I've had people come after me personally and harass me for having it. So it's not something I take lightly or, you know what I mean? So I did that. And then um, I tried a bunch of different medications, over 25 medications. Nothing nothing was working. Um, I had been taking lithium for a long time, but by itself, it just kind of kept me going. But I wasn't happy, happy or thriving. Um, although I was able to, um, I wanted what I had gone through to help other people. And also a lot of people didn't know about postpartum bipolar disorder. They thought it was one of the other disorders. So I did write my book. Uh, it's called Birth of a New Brain. Let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, sorry, everybody. And Healing from Postpartum Bipolar Disorder. And it's endorsed by this brilliant woman, um, Kay Redfield Jameson, who wrote a book called um, An Unquiet Mind and 20 other psychiatrists who are pretty amazing. So I was able to do that, even though I was just kind of, uh, um, and my memory wasn't that bad because I was able to write it myself, a 250 page book, you know, I'm sure there's gaps, but so I did that. But I, you know, at this point, I didn't know anything about something called the ketogenic diet. Okay. I'd never even heard of it. So moving on, thanks for putting up with me, everybody. Uh, and I still wasn't a vegan. Okay. So, um, in just, I'd say like five years ago, I was walking, like I know you do, even though I have a bum knee, I, I was able to walk with my beautiful dog and I did something really stupid. I looked at my cell phone, my mom was texting me and I tripped on a tennis court over a tennis net that was on the ground that I had seen, but I just, it didn't register and I broke my jaw and <laughs> do not walk with your cell phone and look like this. And while I was recuperating, I was watching a lot of Netflix. And one of the films I watched was a documentary called What the Health, which I had heard about because one of our local producers was a producer on it. I read about it in the paper. So I thought, okay, I'll watch this. It's not exactly what I want to watch, but I just did. And it's it. after watching that for two hours, um, I went from being a happy meat eater to a vegan. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about this. I'm not out to change people first of all, and I'm not out to go into detail about why being a vegan is is so great or whatever. It's just my personal choice. And that's part of the reason I wanted to be on your podcast, because I just wanted people to know it's an option. If you already are a vegan or vegetarian, there is vegan keto and there is vegetarian keto, and it can be done safely if you do your homework. So, um, so yeah, I watched this documentary and um, my family, at first they were, there was a little bit of, you know, adjustment, but and I, I couldn't talk about it too much, just like with keto. If I say keto too much, everyone starts yelling. But um, eventually they all decided to eat the same way. So that's been a blessing. And so I haven't had to, to deal with a lot of um, 
you know, resentment or anything weird. It's nice to have a supportive family. Okay, so I'm gonna jump again and then I think I can wind this down a little bit. So a year and a half ago, I was 50 pounds overweight and I started having perimenopause, a wonderful time of life. And I had a huge stomach and it was really bothering me. Uh, long, long ago, before I was diagnosed with bipolar, I'd been a certified personal trainer. So I'd always been interested in health and fitness. And I didn't like looking like I was like six months pregnant at, you know, and it really was getting me down. So um, a friend of mine who's my same age, going through the same thing of the um, feeling overweight, she just said, Diane, I'm doing keto and I've been losing weight. And I always thought keto was, you know, a trend and a fad and unhealthy and meat based. And I just thought it wasn't something I could do. And I'm also kind of a lazy person sometimes. And I just thought, yeah, but I was kind of feeling a little desperate since my, my, one of my best friends is losing weight on this. So I just Googled, um, I Googled keto. And for me, what the game changer was, was I saw it come up with bipolar disorder and that it could help bipolar disorder. And I was like, what? What do, I'm confused because you you Googled keto, but bipolar showed up. Can you do you remember like what the link was that it was showing? I can't. I think it was a gift from God. I'm not kidding. It was a serendipitous thing, and it blew me away. You know, you- I was like, what? And and then I also looked. I found out you could do a vegan keto. I mean, I had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't even know what I was doing. You can't even imagine how shocked I am right now because. It seems like every person I talk to has some sort of story where you're so you you're in the hospital, you find veganism, you're flipping through, you you look for keto, you find you find bipolar. There's every person I've spoken to has some kind of link where where something shouldn't be, it was there. Which I you know, I'm glad. I wish it didn't take so long, but hey, you know, better late than never, right? You know, 47, I finally or oh no, I was old. What am I saying? I was like I'm 53 now, so 51, right? It's the new 30, everybody. Um, (laughs) That's what caught my eye. So I did what a lot of your followers do and what I think you've done. And I just jumped into it, not knowing what I was doing. And then I kept, you know, I like looking online a little too, too much, you know, and I would find, okay, well, I should be taking electrolytes and I should clear this with my psychiatrist and make sure it's okay. When I talked to him, he wasn't familiar with the ketogenic diet. He's like, oh, it kind of sounds like Mediterranean, so I'm sure it's okay. And I'm like, okay, I just want your blessing here. Um, And the more I spent time, like the more and more I found out, and then finally um, I found out that I live only an hour away from this, a place, it's, it's the Stanford Metabolic Psychiatry Clinic. And metabolic psychiatry is, you know, the official term that includes ketogenic diets for mental illnesses. So I'm an hour or 45 minute drive from the first place in the entire world that specializes in this. So I took that as a a, a positive sign. Um, So I just went full all in. And so for me, it's very easy to tell people um, I'm doing this for a really good reason. You know, I mean, I was stoked to lose the 50 pounds. I won't kid you and that, you know, but, it, there's been a lot of other benefits and I am at the very beginning of this road. You know, there's a lot, I know there's a lot to learn and a, and a lot of ways to fine tune this. Um, if you don't mind my saying one more thing, I did hear something that you said that was super helpful um, on one of your podcasts. And you were talking about how there was a big difference for you when you were eating 18 net carbs. And I'm kind. I'm not trying to copy you, but I'm the same way. I mean, just a few car- net carbs can make like a huge difference, whether I'm getting the, reaping the benefits or not. So, I kind of need to buckle down again. And you inspired me. How long did it take you to lose fifty pounds? I was a bad dog, and I it went. It t- didn't take long at all, and I lost it too quickly and not in a healthy way. So, um, I would just say, like, just four months or something like that. I mean, it was, it was too fast. And I have like, I do, I'm not going to show your viewers this, but I kind of have like some weird wrinkles on my body, but that's okay. I'm trying to be more, you know, self-accepting anyway, and it's worth it. So I wouldn't advise people to be as hardcore. Um, I did get what also made the difference for me was using um, the carb manager app. And that did all the mind, you know, all the legwork for me as far as what my daily intake was. But 
I can, you can ask me questions about that. I know that's your specialty. So there's so many things. Uh, my, my first thing is like, okay, so 50 pounds in four months, which I mean, theoretically to me, that doesn't sound strange. I did 70 in five months. So like, I feel like this is an interesting thing of when we give our body what it needs, it just, it just does what it does. And it puts you back to where you're supposed to be. So that part doesn't sound strange. I'm curious to know how being close to the metabolic psychiatry, maybe I didn't understand this. Like, how did that help? Like, did you go there? Did you have interactions with them? In editing this video, I realized that sharing our stories is what will help new people to understand that keto actually works. So if you have improved your health, mental health, or weight through eating healthy keto, please look in the description. There's a form to fill out so that we can do an interview and you can share your story. Keto is more than a diet. It's a way of life that gives you your life back. I'm not a special snowflake. I know that you also have lived amazing things. So let's change this together. The form is below. I'm curious to know how being close to the metabolic psychiatry, maybe I didn't understand this. Like, how did that help? Like, did you go there? Did you have interactions with them? Well, I have had interactions with the director um, through social media because my psychiatrist is going to be retiring soon. He's wonderful. And um, I wanted to get on her wait list because she is, she specializes in bipolar medications and the ketogenic diet. And I am still on my medications and I'm not going to mess with them. I would want to be with talking to this psychiatrist at Stanford to even talk about the possibility of maybe lowering them because I've learned the hard way going off my meds because I didn't want to be on medication and then I would wind up in the hospital and stuff. So anyway, long, I, I haven't gone there. Um, I'm just on, her name is Dr. Shabani Sethi. Um, she's also um, an expert in obesity medicine um, and diabetes and things like that. So she's, she's brilliant. And she actually uh, coined the term metabolic psychiatry so it's nice to see a woman in charge of the clinic, I have to say. Um, but yeah, I'm just on our wait list and it's very long. So we'll see how that goes. My next question is looking at your history. Um, you talk about having had sugar carb cravings that have gone away. That's what you wrote to me when you wrote. I'm curious to know how far back do you remember having carb cravings? Oh my God, Violet, since I was a baby, probably my whole life. That's, I mean, it's been a miracle. And the sugar, I, oh my God, I had so much sugar for, for decades, you know? So when you were doing a normal diet? It's more of a sat, not very healthy. Right. Even as so, a you're, vegan. Yeah, so your standard, oh, let, let's not touch vegan yet. Okay. <laughs> so your, your standard American diet, hold on, hold on. Because I want, I want to get there, but I, I just want to point something out because I think there's an interesting thing here. In your standard American diet, you were eating a lot of carbs? And, but not just normal, like not just vegetables, junk food. There's vegan junk food. Are, are you talking about vegan or pre-vegan? Pre-vegan. Like when you were doing your normal life before you realized any of the stuff, were you doing like junk food? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I grew up on Doritos like, and okay. bread, everything, you name it. I mean, I've been a total sugarholic, carboholic my whole life. And your weight was? It was fine. weird. Like I, it would fluctuate. Um, I wasn't overweight until I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and got depressed and ate a ton of sugar. And then I went from like 140 to 180. And I have pictures to document that. And there it is. Okay. Why am I saying this? The number one thing that I hope people are going to gather from this is that your body is going to do with the sugar, what your body's going to do with the sugar. There's that research that I talked about years ago, and I can't remember now what article it was from, where they took a bunch of people, fed them a keto diet. So a bunch of psychiatric clients fed them keto and all of their symptoms improved. Mm -hmm. yep. It's interesting because we think that all of this stuff is hereditary, but a lot of it's what we're eating. And I'm wondering, I'm just throwing an idea out there for people to think about, the psychiatric things that solve themselves. Is it possibly part of it is because we start eating better and the psychiatric things lighten, right? So I just, I wanted to make sure I was understanding this well when I was reading what you wrote, like that you were talking about before. So now you become vegan, but you're still eating junk food. Yeah. Oh, I would eat vegan ice cream every night. 
there's so many, like there's so much vegan junk food now. And just like with the keto world, there's a lot of things that say keto. They're not really keto, but that's another thing. So you figure out in the hospital, maybe vegan because of whatever you saw in the video, which I haven't watched that video yet. You're not the first person to mention it to me. I probably should watch it. Um, but then you're still allowing junk food. So my health is improving probably because I'm not having as much, or is it really, uh, can I have just as much junk food in a vegan diet as I would have in a normal diet? Of course. You can, yeah. And I mean, just because you're vegan doesn't mean you walk on water or anything like that. It's, it's like with anything, right? It's what you make of it. Um, I just wasn't having that. I mean, I'd eat like, you know, salads and vegetables and fruits and stuff like that. But I just was no um, saint and I loved my sugar. And since they offered it in the vegan version and the ice cream flavors were absolutely amazing, um, you know, it was premium. You know, I, that's every night I'd have a pint, a pint. That's part of the reason I got my menopause belly or whatever. Um, and and you, you understand all this. It's what you eat. And it is it is what you eat for um it's, it's been proven now and i'm going to do a little plug for this brilliant psychiatrist harvard psychiatrist book his name's dr sorry everybody christopher palmer let's see if i can do this again brain energy and it's not just about keto but he talks about the science behind it why it's all about metabolism so it's but it's meant for anybody to read it's not just meant for academia so it's a new york times bestseller He's one of the absolute um, pioneers of this field. And he used to be unhealthy and overweight. And he started it for himself and then re and then his, his patients. And there's some amazing stories in here. People with schizophrenia who were healed through a ketogenic medical diet, not just a regular keto diet. So that's one to get. What would you say has improved since we, because obviously when I start doing keto, or maybe that's not obviously, hmm, when you started doing keto, was that when you were able to make the link between the junk food and your prop, like your issues that you were still living? Oh yeah, it, that's what was weird about this. It was so dramatic. I mean, I was dropping weight, which I've never done in my life, like so quickly, and so that kept me going. But um, I, this was a biggie. This because before I started the keto, I had to take a nap every afternoon at two. I would have this weird crushing fatigue. And it, people say, oh, it's the medications you take, but it wasn't because I hadn't had that. It only happened over the past few years. Once I started doing keto, I didn't have to, I didn't have that anymore. I stopped uh, night binging. I had been night binging the ice cream. I, you know, I know I sound like a lot of your people that you've had on the on your podcast, but you know, the cravings went away for sugar. I was like, what? You know, I was mainlining this stuff my whole life, you know, and my appetite. I, I you know, I'd been, I dabbled in intermittent fasting before, but I just, um, I didn't have to eat during the day. I mean, I was glowing. And the, this is something I should say that's really important. At the very beginning, um, for people with bipolar disorder, you, if you do keto, you can become hypomanic. Um, you can trigger stuff. So you have to be really, really on your game and, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to the people around you. Because uh, if you start that cycle and I mean, with me, I think I became a little bit because I was so happy, but um, it went away on its own, which happens a lot, but it can go the other way too. So just be on it and, you know, make sure you get your electrolytes. That was another biggie. And I was really thirsty. I remember that really, really thirsty the first few weeks. So I was drinking water, but I, yeah, I, um, it was just crazy to not have these cravings that I'd have my whole life and the binging and the energy back. I mean, I wasn't perfect, right? I still had a lot of problems, a lot of anxiety. I have two teenagers and a crazy dog. I won't talk about my husband. <laughs> no, I love him. We've been married for 23 years. So he's been through this with me, but, um, just those those things. And then, oh, I my memory was better. I was able to remember an entire credit card number. Like, I don't know about you. Do you know credit your entire credit? I was like, what? <laughs> Maybe that's not a good thing, actually. Um, but it was a joy. And I, and I said this at the conference, and I was kind of scared to say this, but I just, you taught me in your very first podcast video to be yourself. And I said, I felt like I was in love a little bit, like, it was a, it was just a good, I felt good about myself. You know, I wasn't perfect. I knew my flaws, but it was just a really wonderful discovery in my life. So you mentioned that the, like, while you were talking about when you found 
first of all, let's say when you found vegan, your family came on board. So what helped them to come on board with you at that? Like, can you just help us a little bit to understand meat eaters, all of us? We didn't watch the movie or maybe, or maybe they did. What made them come on board? It was just weird. I mean, I never, I always thought the word vegan was stupid. I thought vegans were weird. You know, it's the same thing with bipolar. Like I had looked down on this my whole life and then I become one, you know, um, with my family, they, uh, I did tell them a little bit about the film. Um, I don't think any of them watched it with me. And, and of course, like everything in life, if I had pressured them to do so, they're just going to resist, right? They didn't want to do that. But I, I just said a few things and my little girl, she's she's always been a huge animal lover, and she walked in on me one day, and I had I was watching some other documentary. I had to stop because they're very disturbing and triggering, you know. And she saw me sobbing, and so she started asking some questions, and so that kind of solidified her decision. Um, but you know, sometimes they eat eggs and some dairy, and I, you know, and my daughter went to Japan for six months, and she decided to, she lived with a family, and she wanted to be able to eat meat and fish, and I didn't say, no, you can't do that, to, you know, so I try to be flexible. It's just my, it's just something I just can't go back on, you know, it's just, in a lot of ways, it would be easier if I could, right? Okay, so you just led me to my next question, sure. which is, you said, <laughs> sometimes we have eggs. So, so how often do we have? Oh, eggs? sometimes they have eggs. Oh gosh, once every few months. So, I mean, I live okay, in. A, you don't. I don't. You don't. I don't, because then I wouldn't be a vegan. But yeah, we live in a right. mountain village where a lot of people have chickens and stuff like that. We used to have chickens, so I'm not going to demonize stuff for them. It's their choice. They they're all of the age where they can figure out. They can make their own decisions. You know. Okay, I'm real. I'm curious. I feel like we have in like five years we have to have another follow up to make. I I would love to like be able to know that everything stays good, right? Because I feel like that's the interesting thing with even what we're talking about today, the bad food that I was eating, which started when I was uh, six months old, because that's when you get introduced your first solid food. Yeah. And what is it usually? Oatmeal or bananas? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what it is in Canada mm -hmm. anyway. And it took uh, blah, 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 46 years for me to get to a pain point that I had to change something. Right, right. So like, I feel like, I'm curious, like this is a big question mark in my mind. Like a lot of times I, I'm talking to people who used to be vegan and it took how many years? So what I love is that you're being followed. So you do have a psychiatrist that, that you're going to be followed by at some point. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I, wanna, I want people to have, if you're vegan, that they know they can do this right. and stay healthy, right? So I'm gonna be super interested. I hope you come back. I oh really my like- God. In my brain, I'm like, five years from now, we need to do another. I would love to. That's update. the proof, right? I mean, I haven't been doing this that long, right? One thing, though, I did want to share, and we can put this in your show notes, too, but um, there are people out there who a lot of your followers might be familiar with. Um, I don't know if you've, you, I'm sure you've heard of this guy, um, the Jeff, Jeff Volick and Steve, Stephen Finney. Isn't this scary that I can't hold the book properly? But, you know, I told you I'm not perfect. Um, now, Stephen Finney, he's like one of my heroes. Um, he was a hero before I found out this quote that I like to say. He said, and he coined the phrase keto ad adaptation. He is the founder of Verta Health, which is a big, big wig company. And he said, doing keto as a vegan is a little more challenging, but it's not impossible and it's certainly healthy. I'd say it's it's more than a little challenging for a lot of people, but to have him believe that. And then my other major hero, I have a there's so many cool people in metabolic psychiatry. I mean, that's why I do want you to have me back. I'd be so honored. Uh, there's a person, I don't know if you know who he is, Dr. Dominic de Agostino. Um, he has he has a website, it's called ketonutrition.org. And he has a great blog about how to eat plant-based. Now, there's some wiggle room with plant-based and vegan, but he writes about it very intelligently. And then he has a, a YouTube video. He just, it's, um, he discusses the vegan and vegetarian ketogenic diet, and he's okay with it. Um, and I, I respect him so much. He's done so much research and stuff. So, you know, you can do it. You can do it. You just, like I said, you have to know what you're doing. And it, it would be great if you could, if your followers could talk to, um, you know, nutritionists who, ketogenic nutritionists to help guide them a little. I wish there were more of them that existed. I know. Well, Georgia Eat has a clinician directory, and I'll give that to you. I don't know if you have that. All over the world, um, there's people on there that you can approach. That's cool. And I, I think the thing that I'm 
so what what I'm looking at is there's so many people who no matter what diet they're doing, they're doing a junk food version of whatever they're doing. And I definitely believe that the number one thing we can do to improve our health is just just take the junk food. So uh, processed food should not be in our diet, first of all. If we take those out, 100%, everybody's gonna improve. That, that's just across the board. Doesn't matter what diet you're doing. But I feel like the thing that's scary for me is that for, for vegan diets, as you're mentioning, there's so many things that you guys can still have that allows you to have a junk food version and I feel like that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you because I also am curious, can you help me? Because again, I've always wondered, how are you, how are you dealing with those um, animal only amino acids that like, how are you getting them? For example, like, how do you get those ones that we just can't get from plants? Okay. Give, give me a, a specific amino acid. Uh, I want to say leucine is one of them. Um, I think methionine might be another one, but I'm not 100% sure. But leucine, I know I hear it heard, said all the time. Like, how do you get those amino acids? Game this. I don't know if I already get those. I've heard them before. There's nine that we need to eat, sure. but I believe there's three that come from only animals. animals. Right, right. Well, I was so like, say, how do you get those two? Sorry. Um, I told sorry. you I'm scissors. Um, well, I do. I One thing I wanted to also talk about that's really important, and it might have something to do I don't think they have amino acids in them, but I do a MCT oil heavy diet. And I did consult with Denise Potter, who is one of the world geniuses with the keto diet. Um, and so she actually looked at what I was eating and she didn't say anything about the amino acids. She was okay with what I was eating, which I still have a big problem with. And I'll be honest, I'll be myself here. I, I have processed food and I don't like that. Um, I It is my goal to start cooking. Like there's a couple really great vegan keto cookbooks that have really accessible recipes and carb manager has recipes. But I, like I said before, I am kind of lazy. So um, that is something I really need to work on. But I, I'll find out about the amino acid thing because that's a good question. I do take um, um, vegan omegas and I take, um, of course, B12 and then, a, you know, multivitamin and all that. But I, yeah, I'm Okay, I'll, I'll find out. Okay, cause, and these are the things, right? Like I, I, I'm, so every time someone asks me in the comments, is it possible to do vegan keto? My answer is, I doubt it, but I want someone to answer okay. this question. I'm gonna write me. it down. Where's my pen? Because yeah, like the healthy, the healthy version is what? Like, how do we get those three? What are we getting them from? So that's just a question I throw out there because we have a uh, follow up with doctors and one thing that I will, again, talking about the experience that I've seen is that every single person who improves what they're eating, their, their, their life improves, their health improves, their weight improves. If you improve the quality of the food that you're intaking, you will get some benefit. It doesn't matter what, if I go from standard diet to Mediterranean, to paleo, to keto, to whatever, vegan, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter which one. Mm -hmm. If I'm using healthy right. foods, my diet improves and then my body will tell me what else I need to do. Hmm. And I feel like this is the other piece of like why I'm having this conversation with you. And I hope you really do come back in, in a few years to like help us update on what, what is still happening, what might've changed, et cetera. But I'll just use myself as the example. When I started my lifestyle in keto, I was doing, so in my standard American diet, almost no vegetables. Hmm. I went to keto, bunch of vegetables, bunch of salads. Like I'm following Dr. Berg's recommendation, right? You load it up. And then as time progressed, it just like went, it started to go back down again. Like the vegetables were just slowly, slowly coming out of my diet until today. I would say I'm practically carnivore. I'm not carnivore because I eat veg like three times, no, two times a week, but two times a week versus I was having every single meal, right? So I feel like the question that I'm putting out there for everyone to think about, but again, I'm going to love when you, when we're going to have another conversation is how does, and maybe you can talk about this already, because maybe it's already happened to you. How do we evolve, right? We start in one spot and it's been five years for you. You started on, on, ve on vegan. Now we've added keto, like how we evolve and what's the signal that we're getting for me, it's pain. What's your signal to make adjustments? Well, sleep like insomnia. 
I mean, are you saying what, what do I need to people on, you know, any kind of keto diet, doesn't matter which kind, um, they'll say their, their sleep improves. That's kind of a hard nut for me to crack. And I have to wonder if it possibly has to do with medications. Um, still, you know, I still have a really good life and it's something I can live with. It's not what I want. Like, I know you don't want your hip pain. I also have occasional knee pain and back pain, but I'm being proactive about it. I'm trying to heal it, you know, and inflammation, right? If we're improving our inflammation, that's a win-win for our body holistically and all that. So a lot, when you were talking about it, I was like, oh, well, guess what? I, Michael and I want you on our new podcast. And I promise if you come on, I'll answer the questions <laughs> that you have. However we can get you on there, I really want to get you on there. But uh, yeah, I mean, you're asking really excellent questions and we're work, we're works in progress. You know, I have a long way to go, but I've come from like, what's weird. I don't know if people notice I'm in this weird padded room and it's kind of disturbing. I write about it in my book because when, one time I, when I was in the hospital manic, I, they put me in a padded room just like this one. I'm like, what is the universe telling me? And I, what I did, it was for being like angry or whatever, cause you can get agitated. Right. So I, and I'm usually such a, I was a nice people pleasing girl before this whole happened. This happened to me. And in the padded room, I sang for like four hours. I sang every song and people were telling me to shut up and stuff, but uh, it's just kind of weird um, to recognize, you know, I've come a long way. I'm in a padded room because I want to be, and I'm with an amazing podcaster extraordinaire who, you know, you were very gracious to have me on considering your viewers and you know i i just you know please be kind weekend warriors you know i'm a vegan but i hate the name too you know <laughs> and there's a lot of ignorant vegans out there and there's a lot of pretentious vegans out there i'm not one of them one thing that i'll say is that whenever we find ourselves in a situation that used to be bad but now we're there by choice we know we've grown right and so you're in the padded room because you chose to be and you're and you're talking on a keto channel because you chose to and and you i mean you came on here the theoretically i could have been vicious and attacking right like you didn't know how it was going to be but i think this is the thing is that when we have messages to share we want to share from every angle and for me it's not about whether you're vegan or not i mean i was again i'm curious only for the point that is there a way to get these three things that like maybe there is an answer and I just don't know what the answer is. Vegetarian? Sure. Eat eggs. Eat eggs every day. Eat bunches of eggs. Like that's the easy answer. Vegetarian, that's the easy answer. But vegan, that's the one that's in my brain. I'm just like, I don't understand. So I feel like this conversation, it isn't about right or wrong because even on a standard diet, we're eating stuff that right that we should, just shouldn't be eating that's not what this is about how do i get the maximum health out of the diet that i'm doing and if i'm doing a standard diet normal standard diet but i'm eating no processed food leaps and bounds ahead and if you're doing a vegan diet and you're keeping your carbs low, so can you talk to us about that how are you keeping your carbs that low what are you eating Oh man, it is hard. Okay. I always, it's funny. I always get asked that question. So you mentioned eggs. I love eggs and I do miss them. So what I do instead, there are processed fake eggs and there's something, I don't know if they have it in Canada, but it's called just egg. It's made out of mung beans and it has protein in it. I don't know if it has the amino acids, but I have that all the time as a scramble. I love avocados. Luckily I, I love all the high fat foods. Um, uh, with the MCT oil, um, heavy diet. I love MCT oil, but that stuff is super powerful and I have to be careful. If I don't have it with food, my stomach gets upset and I can only have it, you know, small increments. So like every morning I have a smoothie with a protein, vegan protein powder and soaked chia seeds and um, MCT oil and almond milk. Uh, and I just started adding what is it called? Oh, spirulina powder. It makes it this really ugly color, but it tastes good. It's supposed to be good for you. So I like it because um, I still have to have chocolate. I have to have chocolate, vegan chocolate. And there's a lot, there's, you know, it's dark, so it doesn't have sugar in it, or it has like, I don't know how you feel about the sugar substitutes, but there's so many of them now, you know. Um, but I do that every morning. So it, it was interesting. I was listening to you also speak about, you know, eat when you're hungry. And I always kind of wake up hungry. 
And that's so that's a habit and a routine. And I also love coffee. You know, I know some people think that's bad or whatever, but it makes me happy. And there's all kinds of wonderful um, vegan creamers that don't have carbs. So you asked, how do I stay under? It, it is very hard to stay under 20 um, because I love like there's these wonderful carbonated drinks that have carbs in them, like Spindrift. And every carb counts when you're really strict with like a medical type diet, right? Even one net carb. I'm, you know, it's hard, right? So, uh, so I kind of go through the day. I do have, um, if I do get hungry during the day, I do have these processed uh, vegan keto bars, and there's a lot of them out there. So you have to be careful. So I wish I didn't, but I do. And it's, it's like kind of like my Linus and his blanket. I feel safe knowing I have it in my purse in case I get hungry and I can eat it, right? I don't always. And, and, and that, so that's my during the day thing. And then at night I have a big thing of, of raw spinach and either uh, a Beyond Burger, olives, avocado, stuff like that. So, and it's funny cause like I have kind of the same thing a lot and I was worried that this nutritionist was going to really rake me over the coals for not having a variety. It makes me happy. And like, I like to say hunger is the best sauce and she was absolutely fine with it. I was like, what, really? You know, oh, I forgot the dessert. I have to tell everyone the dessert, I'm sorry. And I know you don't eat nuts. I think I heard that somewhere, but I can tolerate them, but I have the keto nuts. I just have a few tablespoons of almond butter with cacao nibs and um, a little bit of my chocolate protein powder. And uh, that gives me my chocolate fix. And it's also high in fat. So it's really, um, what's the word, sa sa satiating? You think I could say this word by now? And it, like I said, I, I like this, make, this feels good. I'm happy. It's not the greatest diet. In fact, this woman, um, Julie Fast, I don't know if you've ever heard her. She's a wonderful best-selling author and keto for bipolar advocate. And she likes to say, she's on Instagram and stuff, and she'll say like the keto diet for bipolar is not a healthy diet. I mean, a lot of people will hear that and, you know, but she's in a way it's true. It, it might not sound healthy to a lot of people, right? But do we care what they say? <laughs> here's what i'm going to say okay so many things um why am i doing what i'm doing so i feel like where you started from <clears throat> to where you've gotten to i understand why you're doing what you're doing because like eating this way has helped keep things regulated where you were having those ups and downs and maybe feeling a little bit out of control you're not having them anymore. So perfection, like obviously mental health is a high priority. One thing I like to help people to understand is about when you're talking about enjoying your life, you need both. You need mental health and you need physical health. If I don't have either one, I'm messed up. Like is my life is not going to be happy. So you didn't have mental health happening. Eating this way, ooh, now we're, we're good. Here's the thing. I feel like maybe the way that you found it and found, so the way you found this solution might still be allowing some of those old thoughts from standard American diet to drive the bus here a little bit too much because on this channel, eating for fun is not allowed, right? You prioritize health over taste. And I think that's what you're doing. You're eating for fun still. And that could explain why you still have these processed fun things in your life. So, and it might be a matter of just letting yourself look at it and see that, oh, okay. And you, nobody goes from zero to a hundred. That's, well, that's not actually true. You can, but it's harder. I mean, you could theoretically just take one thing out every, every week or every month. Let's take one thing away and replace it with something healthy. And by next year, you'd be eating what you, the way you want to eat. Cause that's the thing I'm, the reason I'm saying this out, out to you right now is because you're saying, I'm surprised that she didn't say anything. Cause I was kind of looking for for me to get on it right and she didn't so you didn't get on it but you don't need her to get tell you that you're telling it to yourself because you just told it to me right i'm just <laughs> reflecting back to you what you just said to me <laughs> right now what's really cool too is that it shows us another thing that i hope our everyone who's listening all the wellness words are going to understand this in the medical world it's about symptom symptom reduction right so you walk in and you're talking to your nutritionist and you've lost weight and you've regulated your mental health and you know you're showing her all these processed foods and really it should have been okay that's great this was the way to handhold yourself through it and now we start we start addressing them and she doesn't do that because well you're stable 
right? And they're only looking at symptom reduction. But you and I both know if these things stay in your life, we, we risk binging, right? We, we risk that at some point down the road when my body goes back into that homeostatic state is going to give me a new signal to say, hey, pilot, right? And I can do it before it tells me that. So it's not, so that it doesn't hurt. Because when my body tells me, like, at least I know when my body tells me I am in pain when it tells me something, yeah. right? So we can do it before yeah. perhaps I stop sleeping or perhaps I'm on a high or, or something else happens. That makes sense. Everything you said made total sense. I had to work really hard to be quiet because I was like, yes, Violet, I I just I do actually understand everything you said. And part of me did want her to say, like, okay, you need to do this. You know, you shouldn't part there there was a part of me that wanted her to say, okay, let's get one thing not processed. But like you said, I can do that myself. And maybe that is the missing link. Maybe if I did stop with the process, maybe my sleep would improve. Who knows, right? It's all it could only be good. So um, so I'm, you know. I'm I'm motivated. I'm motivated. I can be my my own coach, right? <laughs> I don't need to depend on it. And thank you for saying that because that helped. That really helps me, actually. I'm curious to know, like outside of your house, how have you managed social eating vegan keto? Uh, that's something else I heard you talk about this morning. I was very interested. Uh, you were talking about the four. I think it was four boundaries right? This is a recent podcast you did. It was really good. And um, one of them was social. And for me, it's it's actually pretty easy because everyone, I have a small circle, but they all know I'm doing this. I have a very like serious sounding reason and um, I don't have to justify it. It's much harder for people. You know, my heart goes out to people where they don't have a, a serious mental illness or, you know, epilepsy or diabetes one or two, you know what I mean? But um, I, a lot of times, I, I found myself when I was listening to you, I thought this and I was wondering what you would think of this, but I can go out and be social and I'll just get a coffee because I was telling you, I love my coffee. That way I can be there. And maybe you've said this in one of your many podcasts, I can be there and people know not to mess with me because I'm not going to, at 53, I'm finally learning to say, uh-uh, <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to eat some food. Here, Diane, have a little bit of this uh you know, dessert or what, I'd still get that, but I, I'm, I'm very, um, I put off, I put out the vibe like, uh, uh-uh, no, you know, I'm not saying, you know, no. I think that there must be something <laughs> about being in your fifties. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, finally, I'm like, talk to the hand and it's good. That is nice. You know, there's a lot of things I like about being fifties, but like I said, I think the biggie is I do understand it's really hard to be doing any kind of keto and going to social things, especially now with the holidays. I know Julie said she brought, Julie Fast brought all her food to their Thanksgiving dinner, all her keto food. And she said it went fine. But for a lot of people, that wouldn't be fine. You know, Um, that would cause a lot of problems, right? So just, you know, I just hope people can be strong and get the support they need. If they do have people, give them a hard time. Help me understand. Why do you think it would cause a lot of problems? Well, you know, like people around you, some people don't like to see you doing well, losing weight, and they'll make, you know, negative comments or criticize. They'll look at your food, you know, nothing terrible, nothing, but a, just subtle, subtle put downs, things like that. So that makes me think about our, our self-consciousness too, right? So like you, I'm very capable of going to a restaurant, to anywhere and just having coffee or water if 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 they don't have an espresso machine, I'll just have water. Thank you. Um, and I feel like the interesting thing there though, is that when we, when we struggle with that and it's causing us problems, it might also be because I'm just not solid in what I'm doing yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the truth of the matter is if I eat this thing that you're saying, Oh, but everybody else is having cake, have some cake. And if I eat it and tomorrow I'm going to wake up in pain, you're not there holding my hand saying Violet is going to be okay. So why would I do that to myself? And I think that's, that's maybe why, Sometimes we end up in that, like it, thinking it's a problem. It's not a problem because if I was allergic to this thing, I would say I'm allergic and everybody would stop talking. That's so true. Yeah. No, I love it. I love how you say it. I love how you express that. So I just, I just wish, I just want everyone to, you know, not, not have to struggle with stuff like this. And, but there's a sea change, especially with this wonderful metabolic psychiatry. That's something to be on the lookout now. There's a, there's a buzz going on. And, and that's very exciting to be part of it at the grassroots level. 
So that's why Michael, who is who is one of your guests on your podcast, Michael Bellinger and I decided to do the podcast together about this field. And so we'd love to have all kinds of guests on, including Violet. <laughs> yeah. Going back to what you said a few seconds ago, it's like, we, we don't want people to suffer. I'm going to say something controversial right now. Okay. I'm going to say that we don't want people to suffer. And because we don't want, and that means also we don't want to suffer. So we don't want them to suffer. We don't want to suffer. And it allows a little bit of an open door for companies to come in and say, oh, I have the easy answer for you. Here it is on a platter. And it's not a real answer. It's, it's, a, it's an introduction to their system that we're going to get stuck in for years and years and years to come. So I don't want, obviously, I don't want people to suffer. However, more than not wanting you to suffer, I want you to do the hard thing of figuring out what your body actually needs give it to your body and let your body amaze you because it will. Oh, I love that. I have to say something and that wasn't controversial. Thank you for saying that. I'm going to I'm going to like listen to that again when this comes out. But you know, another reason I do this, honestly, um is that I I think I can say this now. I know life we're going to have suffering no matter what, right? I have an 88-year-old mother. She's not going to be here much longer. Part of the reason I want to get more stable and utilize keto is to be stronger for the for this hard times that I know are coming in my life. And everyone goes through this, right? So the healthy, healthier we are mentally and physically, um, the better, right? So that can, when you're out doing your keto thing, and if anyone says anything, just, you know, put up the white light bubble and just be strong. Like, because I just, another thing that motivates me is I don't want to fall apart like I did when my father died. And it's normal to grieve it's not so normal to become suicidal when your parent dies. And I just don't want to go through that again. Um, and, and I can't control everything, but if keto can help me a little bit in any way, be stronger, dealing with the harder things in life, even the stupid little things in life, um, yay, yay keto, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I know this sounds kind of out there, but it's just. Have you already seen that? Like right now, like in your life, you have oh. young teenagers. You, have you already seen where you manage things a little different? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, I was able to face two enormous fears last month, huge fears, and there's no way I could have done either thing without keto. There is no way. I went on two planes. I had a huge fear of flying. I went on two planes to Boston by myself. I had to get up in the middle of the night to drive to the airport, and then I had to do public speaking, which is terrifying for me in front of like a huge audience of people who are who have degrees from Yale and Harvard and whatever and I did that and I also was able to navigate the Boston subways there's just there's no way I could have done that before keto I would have had to take a nap you know what I mean in the afternoon for two hours so that was and I came back feeling really good and I even I'll just, I'm just going to add this too. Um, I, I had a relative who really let me down when I was in all the hospitals, like all those hospitalizations, a close relative. I won't name names, but um, I had not had contact with this person. I deliberately ceased contact because I was so hurt. And when I came back from this conference, um, something kind of changed a little bit and I reached out to this person and I had coffee with him. And I'm not saying everything's going to be all rosy, but... Um, I think, I really think keto could have shifted something for me to be able to, to do that. that. That's amazing. So basically you overcame a fear and all of a sudden talking to that person wasn't as scary. And all of that, because I'm sharing what I know about keto and how it can improve people's lives and health and et cetera. I, I, again, sometimes those little connection points that we're not sure how they connect, but in the end they do connect. That's really cool. It is cool. But yeah, I just, you know, I, I know keto can't solve everything, but I'm really grateful. I was going to say, we are in our 50s. Like, I never thought, you know, some good things would happen, really wonderful surprises in my life. I kind of thought, okay, that ship has sailed. So I just want your wellness warriors to know whatever whatever ages you are, like, there, you know, you... you very well might be surprised by something good in your life. I really believe that now. If you said that to me a few years ago, I would have been skeptical. Most people, they start keto for weight. Now, I didn't. 
you, you, you did start for weight, but then you fall into this other benefit that's happening with your mental health. I'm wondering if you were talking to a brand new person, not a family member, somebody that you just kind of meet and they're talking to you and they're like, oh, wow, you know, you're eating keto. What's the thing that you're going to say to them, not really knowing them, just like, just what would you say to them as a good reason, not related to weight that any person on the planet could benefit? Okay. Um, I'm not going to throw out statistics, but it seems like all of us, either we have a mental illness of some degree, or we know someone who has a mental illness, or we even know of someone who knows someone. And so my mission now is to utilize keto for mental health, uh, to let people know they can use it, not just for weight loss or for epilepsy or diabetes, but for mental health. It doesn't have to be something dramatic like bipolar. It can just be um, garden variety depression or anxiety. Um, and you can still be on your medications. You don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, this was a revelation for me to find this out, you know? And, and one of the, um, there's a wonderful podcast on called Bipolar Cast, and it has two hosts. One is um, Dr. Ian Campbell. The other one is Matt Bazuki. Um, they both have bipolar disorder, and they both are huge um, advocates in this movement, the metabolic psychiatry movement. And Dr. Campbell, you know, he has a PhD. He's very accomplished, but he started doing keto because he was, he was overweight. So you don't have to have some, you know... And that always made me, that kind of validated me because like it doesn't have to, you can start for whatever reason you want. And then he found out it helped with his bipolar disorder. What I love about that is that, well, first of all, let me make sure I say that if we're taking medication and we do keto, we theoretically should be followed by a doctor because keto can impact medication levels that you need, especially when you drop a bunch of weight, huh, your medication needs to be adjusted. So I'm going to encourage everybody who is uh, trying keto to make sure their doctor is aware. But adding to what you just said, I, what I love is that you, there are all this evidence that's clearly pointing us towards the healthier you eat, the better your body is able to regulate everything that's going on with you, not just weight, but mental health as well. And so you might not be at psychiatric levels of depression, anxiety, anger management issue, frustration, but you could be at low grade kind of, yeah, if you had your food under control, your life would be better. And I think I love that, that you just added there, just letting the world know, hmm, it can help you regulate mood. Right. But I'm glad. Thank you for mentioning that. Because yes, if you do drop a lot of weight, it is definitely going to affect your medications. And some people, they can get off medications completely, or they can decrease. Um, so, but, you know, everyone involved with this, or everyone's really cautious. But I should say, there's one more thing. If people want to check it out. Um, there, there was just a pilot study done. This is brand new, just like a month or two um, old. A pilot study of a ketogenic diet in bipolar disorder. You can Google it. It was presented at the International Society for Bipolar Disorders, which is the main um, association in the world where all the psychiatrists go to it, right? And they were blown away by this presentation, a lot of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So I wish I was there to witness that. <laughs> I love when I hear about new research related to mental health. I love it because I feel like it's that last piece of the puzzle that we're not touching or not talking about enough. And like I said, it's so important to us feeling good and enjoying life. Yeah. So I, I love that. Oh, I know I, I know you're into PubMed. That's awesome. And this, I'm sure you can find this on PubMed. Um, but yeah, there's, 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 I'm, I'm leaving out so much. I don't want to overwhelm anybody, but just it's, it's all there. If just Google away. <laughs> This was an amazing conversation. Can you let people know where they can find you? Well, come to come subscribe to our healing journey with metabolic psychiatry on YouTube. Um, I don't have a really good website yet, but people can follow me um, on Instagram uh, at it's the at thingy. Um, my name Diane D Y A N E Harwood H A R W O O D or Twitter. It's the same. I'm going to link to some of Diane's uh, information below. And I want you guys to click on the link right here to get started with how to start a keto, carnivore, vegan diet, apparently. Like get, get started on a healthy lifestyle. Click on the link. I'm going to meet you over there.